This video is brought to you by John Robson Guitar Tuition. If you enjoy the content, please consider supporting the channel by enrolling on a course, purchasing some guitar lessons or a t-shirt, or you can join my Patreon. Now, on with the show. Hello chaps, welcome once again to John Robson Guitar Tuition. As always, I do hope you're well. It's Tuesday, which means we're doing a top five, uh, top five Tuesday, as this uh, slot has become called. Now, I've already done two videos on uh, influential and iconic guitar designs. And then, uh, along with my pal Steve Hoggart, uh, we did uh, a video where we're talking about uh, influential and iconic guitar players. And I don't know how I missed this idea, but um, someone on the live stream a couple of weeks ago said, why don't you do a top five video about amplifiers? You know, uh, the most important amplifiers in the electric guitar history. And I thought, what a brilliant idea. So that's what we're doing today. Um, now, just to, to let you know what's going to go on, I'm basically going to blether on a little bit about each of the amplifiers in turn. And because I'm not Henning Pauly, although we do share the same uh, hairstyle, um, I don't have um, you know a wall behind me uh, full of thousands of pounds worth of exotic amplifiers. But in order to give you um, a little flavour of uh, what all of these amplifiers sound like, so you've got some sort of context for, you know, what I'm talking about. And you can kind of uh, hopefully, hopefully what I'm saying will make a bit more sense. I've used the, um, I think, very, very convincing and accurate uh, models of all of these amplifiers in Positive Grid Bias. I'm just as a little intro to each of the uh, amplifiers that I'm going to talk about. So let's get cracking straight away with... The Accidental Classic. Yes, indeed, the accidental classic. I'm talking of the Fender Bassman, specifically this incarnation of the amp with uh, four 10 inch speakers, the 4B10 variety, which came along, I believe, in 1954. Just checking my notes here. This amp was originally launched in 1951 uh, to complement the, uh, the Fender Precision Bass. It was a bass amplifier, um, but this particular version with the four 10-inch speakers proved a big hit with the six-string fraternity. Um, at high volume, it, com it basically delivered a compressed, sweet, saturated tone, and um, Fender actually... Uh, acknowledge this when they reissued uh, the 59 Bassman, I think in 1990, because they reissued it as a guitar amp rather than a bass amp. Uh, users or famous users include, well, pretty much everyone, like all of the amps on this list today. You know, they're all iconic because they've all been used by everybody who matters. But, you know, if you're looking for um, players who have, you know, kind of used the uh, the basement sound extensively uh, to make their tone out of it, well, you, you can't really go far wrong when you think of Brian Setzer or Stevie Ray Vaughan. But, you know, other users include Bruce Springsteen, uh, Jimi Hendrix, Kurt Cobain, Albert Collins uh, and Pete Townsend. It is the ideal amp for bluesy country rock or rock and roll or any kind of music that uh, relies upon that edge of breakup sound where you need a little bit of fur around the edges. And there's another reason that this amplifier has a strong claim to fame as being influential. And we're going to find out all about that next. The British Copy. Mm-hmm. 
In the early 1960s, UK guitarists didn't really have a lot of choice when it came to the types of amplifiers that were available. They were craving the sounds that were being uh, heard on American-made recordings, uh, using usually Fender amplifiers like the basement we've just been looking at. This chap owned a music shop in Hanwell in London. He is, of course, Jim Marshall. And amongst his customers were people like Pete Townsend, who was saying, we really want to get this kind of sound. Uh, can you get this amp for us? And Marshall had this idea, well, why don't I just build an amplifier rather than trying to you know, get me hands on these scarce American amplifiers? So what he did was he uh, took the... Uh, the Fender basement that we've just looked at in the previous segment and essentially copied it um, and came up with the Marshall JTM 45 which was launched in 1963. It was designed by Ken Bran and Dudley Craven who worked for uh, Mr Marshall and they copied the Fender basement circuit but with design changes that were made necessary uh, for the different components available in UK that you know, to what were available in the States. 12AX7 uh, valves rather than 12AY7 valves, for example. Uh, Celestian speakers rather than the Jensen originals. And this is um, an amp that is used by many, many guitar players. Peter Green, um, Gary Moore, the whole sound of that Still Got the Blues album is a JTM45 with a Marshall Governor pedal running into it. Pete Townsend, obviously. Angus Young, yes, he uses one as well, apparently, uh, in an isolation box under the stage, uh, mic'd up to mix in with his, uh, his other amp sounds. David Gilmore, Jimi Hendrix. The list goes on. The combo version of this amp uh, propelled Eric Clapton to fame, um, or to, to mega fame, in uh, John Mayles Blues Breakers, uh, so much so that when the combo version of the amp was re-released, it was simply known as the Blues Breaker. It's an iconic amplifier, and it's not a, a Baseman clone. It's based on the Baseman circuit, which I believe Leo Fender got from an open-source uh, text book anyway uh, when he designed uh, when he put together the uh, the Fender basement amp so it's like basically would you Marshall were just taking what Fender had done and adapting it for the components that were available in the UK and yes the Marshall JTM 45 was born and um, pretty much for me one of my favorite Marshall sounds so let's see what's next the benchmark clean Yes, the benchmark of clean sounds. At some point, if you're after a clean sound to record with or to play through, then you're going to be thinking, yeah, I need to get something like a twin reverb sort of sound. It is up there with all of the great amp tones. Many of the amps on this list are known for their overdriven sounds. The Fender Twin will overdrive, but it's primarily known. Its main kind of selling point is its absolutely luscious, gorgeous, clean tone. It originated in... In 1952, let's have a look at it. This is the Blackface version of the amplifier. It's been through many uh, different iterations and evolutions in its long history. There is the uh, big box version, the blonde version, the Blackface one that we've got here, so-called because it has a black control panel. Uh, the red knob version, which I believe came out in the 80s or thereabouts. And even uh, there's even been a solid state version of it um, at one point. It is an amp, as I say, which is known for its characteristic clean tone. Um, Leo Fender saw this as the amplifier that guitarists would want in the same way that he saw the bassman as the guitarist that, as the amplifier that bass players would want. Um, the classic era is that uh, 63 to 67 blackface era, though. Um, you know, it's it's known for its 
it's hi-fi pure but not clinical sounding warm but pure and uh, crystalline clean sound famous users include once again pretty much everybody you can think of it's hard to find a guitar player who hasn't used a fender twin reverb at some point but just to throw a few names out there mark knopfler eric johnson Chuck Berry, The Beatles used Fender Twin Reverbs, Joe Bonamassa, Eric Clapton, the list goes on and on. Any time you've heard that characteristic Fender-y clean sound on any kind of recording, there's a strong chance that it's been played through a Fender Twin Reverb amp, so it had to be on the list. Next. Class A Warmth. Yes, indeed. Class A warmth. What exactly does that mean? Well, um, I did a video oh, years ago explaining, because I've got a bit of a background in electronics, what the basic principles are of uh, valve or tube amplification, and I'll link to that in the description box below. But basically, it's a different way of using uh, valves or tubes. Uh, to uh, amplify a signal it, it it differs from the way that a fender or a, a marshall amp will typically use the, it's a different design of circuit we'll leave it at that as i say go and check out the video down below the amp i'm talking about here is obviously the vox ac30 um it was created at the request of Hank Marvin, nonetheless, who was already playing through a Vox amp. It's uh, its little brother, the Vox AC15, a 15-watt amp, and he needed more volume to get over the um, the sound of the screaming uh, adolescent girls at uh, Cliff Richard concerts. It was designed by Dick Denny, who worked for the uh, JMI Corporation. Is that Jennings Musical Industries? I think it is, yes. Uh, but that Class A circuit does give it a characteristically warm, but yet uh, clear, jangly kind of sound. You know, think um, early Beatles, basically, and you won't go far wrong. But also, again, think Hank Marvin. You know, that's uh, pretty much the, the Shadows sound is very much the sound of a Vox AC30. It's great for, as I say, Beatly pop, Beatlesy pop. Uh, twangy Hank Marvin tones, but it also overdrives and saturates beautifully well, as can be attested to by a certain Mr. Brian May. Um, it's identifiably got a rounder, warmer sound than uh, Class B amplifiers like Marshall and, and Fender and so on. And famous users of this amplifier, as I say, include Hank Marvin, The Beatles, but also status quo. This amp here that you can see here is an ex-status quo amplifier. Uh, Snowy White. Noel Gallagher is a big fan of the Vox AC30. Think of uh, jangly guitar sounds. At some point, you're going to think about uh, REM, Pete book uh, from REM was also a big fan of um, the Vox AC30 Mike Campbell uh, from uh, Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers another big Vox AC30 user and surprisingly Richie Blackmore as well you think of Richie Blackmore with that uh, big wall of Marshall amplifiers behind him but he was also fond of the AC30 from time to time so with any uh, list of users like that I think this amp definitely deserves a place on a list of iconic amplifiers Next, the sound of rock. <laughs> Yes, possibly the only amplifier that I can think of, at least, that it's that's better known by its 
uh, unofficial nickname rather than its official company designation. Let's get that one out of the way first. I'm talking about the Marshall Super League 1959. Here it is. Um... 1959 is is nothing nothing to do with the year 1959. That is just an internal uh, Marshall Company designation. Most people, though, of course, know this amplifier because it's got a, a control panel which is made of perspex, or in American speak, plexiglass, and it is therefore known as the Marshall Plexi. Um, this is the amp more than any other I think that you that you picture in your head when you think of a Marshall stack when you think of um, those iconic images of Jimi Hendrix stood in front of two 4b12 cabinets with a, an amp head on top this is the amp that you're probably picturing in your head um, it originated uh, from a request by Pete Townsend as, as the Who were playing bigger and bigger venues. And this was in the days before, um, you know, amplification was mic'd up and put, up, put out through a front of house uh, PA system. The only way the people at the, at the right, right at the back of the big music venue could hear your guitar sound was from the, you know, from the, from the decibels that your guitar amplifier was pumping out. And, um, Pete said to Jim Marshall, he said, that JTM 45 is a great sounding amp, but it's not loud enough. Can you do a 100 watt version? And the Marshall Plexi was born. It's also available in a 50 watt version, which is the, um, the the model that you heard me playing through at the top of this clip um it was marshall's first 100 watt amplifier and as i say it it's it was basically the the origin of the marshall stack um it originated in 1965 and lasted all the way till 1981 when it was superseded by the marshall jcm 800 another um classic amp in its own right now the, the 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 Marshall Plexi, the Super Lead 1959, was a two-channel amp, but not in the way we think of a, a two-channel amp in this day and age. These days, you think it's a clean channel and there's a dirty channel, and you can foot switch between the two and you know have two sounds on tap. That's not the way it worked. There were basically two sets of inputs onto the amplifier: uh, a normal channel and a lead channel. And uh, you made a choice whether you wanted this sound or that sound uh, when you plugged in. Guitarists, though, soon cottoned onto the fact that you could run a cable between uh, these two channels, uh, ju yeah, jump a cable and jump the channels together, and get a combination of both sounds, which is classically what's thought of as being the Marshall Plexi sound. If we're going to talk about famous users for this amp, well, once again, it's difficult to find a guitarist who hasn't used a Marshall Plexi at some point. But I'll just throw a few names out here. Um, Jimi Hendrix, Pete Townsend, um, Dickie Betts from the Allman Brothers, uh, Van Halen, you know, Eddie Van Halen's early guitar sound was a Marshall Plexi, ACDC, Ingve Malmsteen, Randy Rhodes, Slash and Ace Frehley, all but a few names of who've played through a Marshall Plexi and got their tone out of it at some point or other. It is, I think, more than any other amplifier, the sound that defines rock guitar. Which is why it's on the list. And there you have it, folks. Uh, those are my nominations for the five most iconic guitar amplifiers. I've tried to go for um, amplifiers that, um, you know, are the origins of a particular sound here rather than... I could have easily mentioned the JCM800 in here, but without the without the Plexi, would you have had the JCM800, you know, and so on. So I might do another video, a follow-up video to this where I mention another five, but for the moment, these are the ones I'm sticking with. Uh, the, uh, the Fender 4B10 Baseman, the Marshall JTM45, the Fender Blackface Twin Reverb, the Vox AC30 and the Marshall Plexi Amp. Those are my, I think, top tier amplifiers that, um, you know, are just the most important ones in rock guitar history. Let me know what you think in the comments section below. Have I missed off your favourite? Do you have any suggestions? Are there any amps on this list that you don't think deserve to be there? You know, what in any way that you want to disagree with me, please feel free to do so. It's, um, you know, open discussion is... Uh, is all good by me. 
and that is the video for today folks hope you've enjoyed it found it reasonably entertaining and if you have please hit the subs subscribe button and notification bell if you haven't already done so and why not give me a like while you're at it don't forget the live stream every friday 5 p.m uk time where you know what happens we drink beer and talk about music and guitars what's not to like come along and join us it's fun but for now i'll bid you all a good day and say thank you so much for watching thank you for your time look after yourselves folks stay well stay safe and above all stay sane bye for now